evening. Thank you for being patient. It's a discipline conference. Uh, before we begin our Vesper service this evening, we bow our heads as we pray. Eternal Father, being with us from the beginning of this day to this moment. Thank you because of the spirit that has led in all the discussions. Thank you again for the olivers. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Speak to us through them. Take the glory for everything. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I think this is a bit anticlimactic in that we know the Olivers so well. We understand that they have a mission. The mission is for the elevation, the enrichment, and just the enlargement of values and principles on the Adventist family. And since 2010, they have led this huge responsibility in the General Conference of our World Field headquarters in Silver Spring. And so just for a few moments, uh, I will say a couple things about Dr. Willie. Uh, some you may know, some you may not know. And then uh, Susan will say some comments about Sister Elaine. As I said, the Olivers have a passion for marriage that goes back many years. He is preeminently qualified uh, to fill this position for he has served as a lead pastor in a New York church, and there he distinguished himself as one who loved people, loved the ministry. But immediately, it was at that very time as a pastor, at the very beginning, he showed a real interest in families, probably prior to that in his education. But surely there in the church in New York, he, he and his wife began to develop the concept of the value, the centrality of the Adventist family. From there, he went to the Greater New York Conference, he went to the Atlantic Union Conference, and then he was uh, selected uh, through so many qualified persons to lead the North American Division in Family Ministries. And there he did a distinguished job, and he and Elaine uh, showed themselves as people who were passionate about uh, the family and building it and really making it all that God wanted it to be. And from there, he was asked from the North American Division to be the director, he and his wife, the directors of the Family Ministries Department of the General Conference. Uh, you have his credentials in your booklets. I will say that he is, he's educated, uh, preeminently so, with a PhD and a couple masters and other degrees. He's a requested speaker. He's a creator and a writer. Uh, he is balanced in his life and habits. But probably best of all, he is married and in love with Elaine. Can you say amen? amen. That's Dr. Willie. Please. <laughs> I feel like you know Elaine quite well. Um, Elaine is a mother. You know that she's the mother. She and Willie have two children. They have a son and a daughter, Jessica and Julian. Um, Elaine mentioned Jessica last night. But I don't think she mentioned that Jessica is getting married in September. September, yeah. Yes, so there, you, you heard it. I know you heard it before, but we just wanted to say the, the month. Um, Elaine is highly educated and brilliant. She knows how to apply her education to practical problems and come up with practical solutions. She has three master's degrees. She has a degree in clinical mental health counseling. She has one in counseling psychology, and she has one in adult education. And I think you might know that she is almost finished with her PhD. Yes. Amen for that. So we are really calling her now Dr. Elaine. <laughs> We're doing it prophetically ahead of the time. We're happy for that. She's been a university administrator and a corporate uh, consultant. I know her to be an empathic, sensitive, and caring friend who really loves life. She's a lot of fun to be around. You just enjoy her. She loves God. If you ask her to tell you about herself, she'd say, I'm a mother, I'm, well, I'm a wife. <laughs> I'm a mother, and I'm a disciple. That's what she would say about herself. 
but she and Willie form a true team ministry. Yeah, yeah. And as they travel around the world, that is something that we really appreciate, the fact that they are such a compatible, such a good, and such a loving representative team. Please join us in welcoming your friend and our dear friend, the Olivers. Say amen. Thank you very much, Shalu. All rise, we'll do this one a cappella, and I'm thinking it's for the last time we're singing it, so let's sing it with all our hearts. If they can quickly project for us, please. It's 655. Okay, let's use our programs. Happy the home where God is there and love is every breast. When one the wish and one the pray and one the Thank you. Test, test, test. 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 Is it possible for me to get a, a hand Help. mic? Okay. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. This one is working. Test, test, test. 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 Thank you, Sister Papu, for um, helping us to enjoy that, um, that theme song. It's um, wonderful to sing it, but it's even wonderful to hear a beautiful voice leading it. And we've enjoyed that. May I take this opportunity to thank Pastor Bindas? Because when I sent out the email, one thing I can say about Pastor Bindas, he's just fast on the draw. You know, if he were in the West, in the Wild West, he would be, uh, he would be the fastest gun in the West. So when I sent out an email to the directors asking for um, their suggestions for theme song, he was the first one to respond. and. He suggested this song. And I said, ah, terrific song. It's like Adam, you know, he only needed one wife. So we had one, one hymn, we're singing it, and it's beautiful, and we thank you. 
Uh, there is one person we left out. This is what happens when you start calling names and you don't have a list in front of you. You're about to miss someone. And we miss someone who I want to mention right now, and that is someone very pivotal who's been extremely helpful to this conference, and that's Sister Teresa, who is uh, Mr. Caro's um, assistant. And if Teresa is here, Teresa, are you here? Thank you so much. You've been wonderful, and you've been praying for us as well. She wrote me several times in the last couple of weeks. Thank you. The IT people. Michael, Michael has been amazing, and his team. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. And uh, if we are leaving out anyone, thank you too. Thank you to Joshua, um, the wife, the husband of a big ale, <laughs> for making sure that we got our boxes and uh, the materials for this conference that we mailed. He's the one who went and got them out of customs. So thank you so much. Right now, we're going to talk to you for just brief moments on leaving with stronger, healthier, and more dynamic family relations. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day. What a blessing it has been. And we are so grateful to you for giving us this opportunity. And we just ask you to do it again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we usually like to begin by introducing our family. And this is our family. Um, the Lord has blessed us with two children. Um, actually, I wanted to have three children. I wanted to have one. <laughs> and so we compromised, and we had two. Our firstborn is Jessica, and Dr. Susan mentioned Jessica. We'll say a little bit more about um, her upcoming nuptials soon. But Jessica is um, currently working for the, the, the youth department at the General Conference. She is, has a master's in public health, but the Lord called her into a different um, area, and we're thrilled that um, she is being used in this capacity right now. Uh, Julian is our son. He is um, our second and last born. And when we had him, of course, I, I pastored single uh, for a little bit, a couple of years before we married. And then once we got married, uh, our members were always asking, Pasta, when are you going to have children? Some of them actually said, Pasta, you know? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we had. Jessica, three years later, and then um, Pasta, when you're going to have another one. And then, you know, we had Julian three years later, and then Pasta, when you're going to have one. I said, no, Pasta is done. <laughs> I said, Bible says, blessed is the man whose quiver is full, and my quiver only fits two, it's full. I call them Alpha and Omega. Yeah. So this is our family. What we like to say about our family is that um, we're not a perfect family. You know, our family is just like your family. It's a human family, filled with frailties just like yours, challenges just like yours, but filled with hope in Jesus. Amen. That's the only thing that makes us different than people who do not know Jesus. If you know him, you should have that hope as well. Here's another picture we want to show you, and this, uh, this is um, Larry. This is the man who should have paid La Bola. I wish we were in South Africa or something, you know, or somewhere out here. So uh, he could have stepped up and show us that he could take care of our daughter. No. But this is Larry, and this is a picture where we're saying, you see, our son is not sure he wants him in the family yet. And I'm saying, is this the one? And uh, that's Jessica's dog on Larry's lap. That's Rosario, named after the city in Argentina, since she um, spent a year in Argentina learning Spanish. and. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of sort of um, letting him into well, the family. Well, notice, notice that Jessica is holding on to Daddy, but she's, she's stretching out her hand to Larry. You know, Pastor Bindas, she's saying, this is the one, Daddy, that I have chosen. Now, Sister Papu sent me a text right after I sent her the, the announcement, and she said, my sister, I hope we're negotiating La Bola. <laughs> we, we must get a good Labola, right? Yeah, we must get Pastor Papu. Dr. <laughs> Papu, who is the greatest ne Labola negotiator, he'll ask for 50,000 rand. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we'd rather $50,000. <laughs> and then, of course, at last, here we are, where it's a little happier, and uh, here we are. We've allowed him into the circle, yeah, almost, yeah, yeah. almost, almost into the circle. Almost. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Susan asked, uh, do you guys keep in touch with your children while you're on the road? I said, we do. We have, um, we have a chat, uh, the four of us. And she says, is Larry a part of that? I said, mm, 
not yet. I said, he's, he's not yet in the circle of trust. You know, I, I say that there's many, a lip, uh, uh, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. You know, you're drinking tea and ah, it falls. So we'll wait until the cup reaches the lips yeah. before we allow him into the, the circle chat. of <laughs> trust. trust. But we like Larry. Pray for Larry and pray for Jessica. She's getting married. They're getting married in September. We're happy for them. And um, we wish for them what we wish for all the young people in the church who are getting married. So pray for us as a family as we go forward. So Jessica is getting married in September, and our family is very excited. And this is the day that we celebrated the announcement, and um, uh, we have our own interesting traditions. Jessica says, Mom, you're so ceremonial. And so I, I went to the store and I bought this big book of weddings and I packaged it and I put it in a bag with wrapping paper and I gave it to her and I took her out to breakfast and we had a wonderful time. Um, and our daddy even got involved a little bit into the action. He got a hold of the book and I saw him looking through it with excitement. And even though he wasn't showing too much excitement, Dr. Papu, because you know, he has to preserve that, you know. The negotiating that edge. Negotiating edge, doesn't want to be too excited. Um, but there he was, we caught him looking at the book. And so we are You, you notice I'm just coming from exercising. You know, I mean, I'm getting ready to run or something. I don't know. You were just coming back from coming exercising back from and trying to sneak a look at the book. So we are in the throes of wedding planning. And I don't know what that looks like here, but where we come from, this is what it looks like. There are just lots of moving pieces. There are budgets, and there's a ceremony we have to think of, and the reception, and there are flowers, and there are dresses, and there are suits and tuxedos. There are gifts that have to be given. There's money, there's money, and there's more money. <laughs> so we pull. You know, we, we pull. We're very pull. But one of the things that we tell our children is that it's not just about the wedding planning. Oh, I wanted to, to share this because the weddings are beautiful and this is what it looks like at the end of all that planning. Do you see any of your cultures represented here? Wow, that look, those look like Zulus. <laughs> yeah. So the, it's festive and it's fun and a lot of planning goes into all of this, all of this. <laughs> so what can I say? Hair is overrated. They're dead cells. <laughs> it's a billion dollar industry. Ah, that's a highway robbery. I mean, all of us should just look like me. <laughs> Guess what? I never have a bad hair day. So a lot goes into wedding planning. But what's more important than the wedding planning is the marriage planning. And we spend a lot of time and effort and money and energy into an occasion that for us lasts one day. It's not even a full day. In fact, the, the, the ceremony venues will tell you you have exactly five hours. And if you go over that time, it's going to come at a high price. So you may want to just stay within your five hours. But what we want is we want couples, and this is what we've shared with our daughter and with our future son-in-law, is that we want them to be prepared for this holy sacrament, this covenant, that it's more than just this day. In fact, there's a wonderful quote that Ellen White has which says, however carefully and wisely marriage may have been entered into, few couples are completely united when the marriage ceremony is performed. The real union of the two in wedlock is the work of the after years. And so we want to do more than just prepare for a day. That's very superficial. It's just on the surface. We want to prepare them for a lifetime of covenant together, regardless of what happens, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, in good times 
and in trials until death do us part. That's what we're preparing for. It's marriage planning. Marriage planning and wedding planning. Not that the day shouldn't be a wonderful time. Not that it shouldn't be an enjoyable time. Not that it shouldn't be a joyous time of friends and family and well-wishers. But the marriage is much more important. So, I'll tell you something about the parable of the ten virgins. Let's go to the Bible. I love going to scripture so that we can really see and hear what God has to say. We're reading from the New King James Version, and here's what the Word of God has to say. Then the kingdom of heaven, read in your own Bibles as we read from ours. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. I like to say five were wise and five were otherwise. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lambs are going out. <laughs> but the wise answered and said, saying, No, lest there should be not enough for us and you, but go gather, rather those, uh, go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. <laughs> and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Do you know? Do you know? We don't. So our jobs, our job is to watch, is to be wise instead of foolish. So let's see how this plays out. Here's what it looks like. So as we, we talk about, we've been talking about our daughter's wedding and we look here at another upcoming wedding ceremony. And I just wanted to interject this because as, I, as we look at this passage of scripture, um, and you know, it talks about the, the foolish ones not being ready. Um, it's, it's like one of my nightmares as we're getting ready for the wedding. Um, you know, we're, we have spreadsheets. We have spreadsheets, Dawn. And I've already told Dawn, she's going to be helping me with those, you know, the timeline, you know, the minute to minute thing, because the wedding can't be late. Um, but there's, th there's, a, there's a nervousness that I have that we won't be ready, you know, that, that the day will come and, and, and we'll wake up and, and we won't be ready. And, and so it was with what happened here in this passage of scripture. But when we, when we look at the, the, the 10 virgins, there were attributes of the wise and the foolish. So let's take a look at the attributes of the, the wise virgins. They were dressed for the occasion. They had lamps. They were waiting anxiously for the festivities to begin. And they slept. There were also attributes for the foolish virgins. They were dressed for the occasion. They had lamps. They were waiting anxiously for the festivities to begin. And they slept. Hmm. So what's different? What's different? Anybody sees a difference? Do you see a difference? No difference. They all look the same, right? The one, the people of darkness and the people of light often look the same. So what was the difference? What was the problem with the foolish virgins? They were dressed. They had on the garments. 
They had their lamps. They were Adventists. They were baptized. They some were of even, them were vegetarian. even vegetarians, I'm told. And some, yeah. and some, as you say here in Africa, vegans. Some were even vegans. No cheese, no milk. Some of them even ran marathons. They worship. Yes. They prayed. Yes. They knew the 2300 day prophecy. Yes, and in Africa, some of them even swayed when they sang. Marching to Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem. When we were in South Africa uh, last year, at the women's ministry, oh, they made us do the South African dance. Marching to Jerusalem. They said they're going to make us dance at the wedding. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. This, strike that from the record. So they were dressed, but they were not ready. They had all the trappings of being ready to meet the bridegroom. They had all of their cultural practices. Paid la bola. And they did it right. They negotiated they 50, negotiated it in an equitable way. But the problem was their heads were transformed, but their hearts were not. They had a head, head religion, but not a heart religion. They held on to their cultural beliefs and their world views, and they never fully allowed themselves to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. They never allowed themselves to be discomforted. They were comfortable while they slept. In fact, Ellen White tells us something about these foolish virgins. She says, we cannot be ready to meet the Lord by waking when the cry is heard. Behold the bri bridegroom. And then gathering up our empty lamps to have them replenished. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. So we've spoken a lot about African culture and African tradition. And, and we've discovered that there's some, there's some beautiful aspects, even to some things that have been skewed, that have been abused. But at the same time, have we dichotomized our lives of what God is saying from our culture? Not allowing our culture to be touched by the word of God. And many have spoken about this, but we want to reiterate it. We, we need it to, to sink into our hearts because we, we, we've, we've, we've used our culture and all of us, and that's why I say this is a gift to the world church because we all need to examine our practices. In fact, let me just segue again um, about weddings. As we're planning our wedding, everybody is calling me and saying, you have to do this and you have to do that and, and you have to do this, this tradition. And, and I finally said to someone the other day, because they said, well, if you don't do that, it's just, it's just not going to look right. In fact, you're the Olivers. <laughs> and so this must be a part of your wedding. And I said, you know, actually what you're saying is not accurate, because that particular tradition that you want us to have in our wedding was never a part of the original American wedding. It was something that came about in the roaring 20s when weddings were becoming more popular. In fact, what, what we, and more fashionable, more fashionable. Prior to that, weddings took place in people's homes with the pastor. So very important, the pastor. If you were wealthy, you got to use the church because you could invite more people and feed them. 
but the wedding took place between the parents of the bride and groom, the pastor, and the bride and groom. And that's the and American wedding. And that was the American wedding. It's not even the Edenic wedding. There were not a whole lot of um, guests. There was not a whole lot of eating. It was just the groom, the bride, and God. Wow. God was the witness, and he performed the wedding. And they were fine. Some people think, I don't know how it is in Africa. Actually, I do know how it is in Africa. Weddings are for everybody. The whole village comes out. But you're communal, and you collaborate. You contribute. Where we come from, in the West, where we are individualistic, no, your daughter is getting married. You pay. So we often say to couples who we are working with in premarital, we say, invest in your premarital. Don't worry too much about the wedding. It's just one day. Weddings are to get married. Married. Weddings are to get married. If the past, if the pasta is there and your parents are there, your brothers and sisters are there. That's it. Here's what we know. It doesn't matter how many thousands of dollars you spend on weddings. It doesn't matter what kind of gourmet food you have. The people are going to come and they're going to talk about you. They're going to say, ah, you didn't like the food. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you get. So why are you spending all your money to feed people who are going to say, ah? Oh, where are my Nigerian friends? Ah! All my friends from South Africa, Aish! <laughs> right? So, um, right. So I said, I said just the other day to someone, ah, we just need to have some punch and cake at the church and call it a day. And one of our relatives says, oh, you can't do that. I said, why not? We're here to marry your daughter. What's wrong with punch and cake after the wedding? You want to eat? Go home. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm, I'm stepping at some of your traditions. Where, In fact, a friend of mine, a pastor, pastor from South Africa, sent me a picture once on WhatsApp and was a man with five plates of food. And the caption said, after the funeral of a man who owed him money. <laughs> so he owes money, so he's trying to make up for it in death. Eat up all the man's food. <laughs> Try to get paid back. Well, that's not what we're trying to do in, in, in weddings, but let's get back to where we are. Here's what's important about this. Five wise virgins, true followers of Jesus Christ. Huh? Five wise virgins. So, it's become more poignant to me during our last couple of days here together on this issue of culture because it's come to a head. Because even as I'm hearing the different presentations, which were wonderfully done, I'm thinking about the other cultures in the world that we get to visit. And as soon as this is done, we're leaving. And we're not heading home. We're heading to Central Asia. We're going to Kazakhstan where it's cold, colder than what we left in the United States. That's what makes it tricky to pack and to get ready. But back to the followers of Jesus Christ. Five wise virgins. What made them wise? And how can we be wise? Well, you know, I, I was intrigued as we were preparing for this about what made them wise. Because remember, they all had lamps. And they all had lamps that had oil. But what, what was the difference with the wise ones? Do you remember? They had extra oil. Mm. They had extra oil. So they, they understood that it was not enough for them to have oil in their lamps, that they needed a primary source of replenishment. They understood that. And so they kept their oil stores replenished even though they didn't know when the bridegroom would come. They sought to stay connected with the source of light. 
They were not afraid of searching the scriptures and examining themselves. They were prepared for the delay and they were also prepared for the sudden arrival. So even though they slept, they slept expecting that there might be a sudden arrival. And the lamps had to remain burning because go back and read it in, in Christ Object Lessons, um, chapter 29. Ellen White talks about the whole thing and she, she explains the cultural understanding of what was happening in that day and why the lamps had to be on. The lamps had to be on to light the way for the bridegroom and light the way to the marriage ceremony. So they knew that at some point, if the bridegroom delayed, the lamps would burn out. So don't get caught up with the fact that they slept. They slept prepared. The lights on. Their lights were on and they had a, sto a, a replenishment source. And for us, we understand that that means that we need to stay connected with the word. We need to allow God's word to inform us. But the only way that can happen is if we stay connected to the word. And, and that we don't do what Dr. Dupre said is only find the texts that support what we want to do. And say, oh, well, hey, Jacob had two wives. So, well, maybe God is flexible. That proof text method can also mess you up because uh, like the person who said, uh, well, you know, it's in the Bible. I want to do what the Bible says and I, I'm going to have God lead me to what it, I'm just going to open the Bible and just point. And wherever I point, I'm going to do what it says. And he opens, go and do like, oh, no, Judas went out and hung himself. And then he opens again, go th thou and do likewise. So, you know, that could be problematic. So you don't want to do that kind of studying. You want to be more, more comprehensive. There's more the wise virgins, while they participated in the prevailing cultural norms, they recognized their greater responsibility was not to the customs or even participating in the wedding activities, but rather, as Ellen White says, in the parable, the wise virgins had oil in their vessels with their lamps. Their light burned with undimmed flame through the night of watching. It helped to swell the illumination for, sorry, them to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honor. Their light burned with undimmed flame through the night of watching. Shining out in the darkness, it helped to illuminate the way to the home of the bridegroom to the marriage feast. And so they knew that their reserve oil was a guarantee that they would be ready for the announcement. Their obedience to God was not an obedience out of fear. It was not an obedience out of um, obligation. It was an obedience out of true love and gratitude for the one who is the source of all light. You know, it's interesting that when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus really giving an exposition of the values of the kingdom of God, Right in the middle of that, he says, so let your light shine. Let your light shine. And then he goes on to say, you are the salt of the earth. In that same sermon. So if we're going to be light, we have to be connected to the light, Jesus Christ himself. It means we have to buy in to the values of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and here, here's the thing about how it works. It's, it's kind of a zero-sum game. The closer to Jesus, the further away from whatever is not Jesus. See? Use, use your other example. You often use an example of, like, travel. Like if oh, yeah. Well, well, let's do it now. Some of us are leaving tomorrow. Many of us are leaving tomorrow. I was just talking. Oh, we, we did some walking this morning with Dr. Baker and Dr. Dupre. And um, he said, oh, I'm leaving tomorrow morning on the same flight with Dr. Papo. <laughs> so they're going from here to Johannesburg. Here's how it works. If you get on a plane and you're heading to Johannesburg, the closer to Johannesburg, the further away from Nairobi. It's like that with God. If we're disciples of Jesus Christ, true followers, and we have embraced the gospel, 
the closer to the culture of Christ, the further away from any cultural practices, whether it's Western or African or Asian or Latin American, any custom that is not compatible with the gospel of Christ. Because the gospel of Christ is light, and he says, let your light shine. And if we hold on to practices that are not compatible with the gospel, and those practices are a part of darkness, because that's, those are the opposite poles, light and darkness. And we can't be both, because here's what happens. When light comes, darkness flees. They cannot abide in the same space. They cannot. When we try to do that, there's a theological word that uh, you know, Dr. Naoma can talk to you about. It's what you talk about here in the seminary. When you're trying to put light and darkness, and we call it syncretism, we say we want Christ, but we, want to let, we don't want to let go of stuff. And as Dr. Popple well said the other day, yesterday, we don't know where it comes from. We just know it's our culture. And when someone says something, the gospel, and the light of the gospel comes, and it shines into the darkness of our practice, like, oh, no, that's my culture. Ah, then you have to ask yourself what culture you want to be, long to, the culture of light or the culture of darkness. And I'm not in any way suggesting that the culture of Africa is darkness. No, I'm suggesting that all the cultures of the world have darkness in them. Darkness is embedded in all the cultures of the world. And for the people of God to really be the people of God, they're going to have to come to the light, embrace the gospel, and live it out. Why? Let your light shine. For what? So people can see how you live and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Sister Nandeba said it earlier on. She quoted a beautiful passage from Adventist Home, page 32. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Do we want pastors? We want the pastors to get demons? Yes. Someone once said, oh, do you notice the trend? I said, what's the trend? The demonization of the ministry. <laughs> Let's get back and finish, Elaine. Let's finish. Here's what Paul has to say. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. So he's already said it. What we want to leave here with, what we hope we will all, and we are speaking about ourselves because we have been moved, is that we're not trying to figure out how we can make our culture, our worldview fit into God's word. We want to ask God, how can we fit into his worldview? We want to be transformed into his likeness. We want new hearts. We want new minds. And you know, God, you know, sometimes I am so amazed as I study more and more about the human brain. I laugh because you know that scientists are just now finding out about the intricacies of the human brain. For instance, in the last 10 to 15 years, we have discovered this thing, maybe 20 years, called plasticity. You know what that means? Remember, they used to tell us, those of you who are like 50 years old or above, that once you got to a certain age, you could no longer learn new things. That's not true. We can continue learning until we die. Now, of course, there might be some, some um, problems if you develop certain diseases, you know, dementia, but aside from that, we can learn new things. Our brains can actually make space to learn new things. That's really exciting to me because I have a horrible memory for names, but I'm not going to claim that anymore because your mind believes what you tell it. So I'm going to start telling myself I have a good memory for names. My problem is I remember names and I may call you Daylene. 
You know, I know that, like, you know, they, t they say you should use, like, these little mnemonics and these little brain tricks. And so I used the brain trick, but then I remember the trick and not the name. <laughs> but we can learn new things. You know why this is exciting? Because God, the creator, he knew from the beginning what our minds could do. And so he says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new mind. And he knew what he was talking about. So there's no longer any excuses. Because what we hear as we travel the world is, that's just how I am. I'm too old to learn anything new. That's the way my mother did it. That's the way my grandmother did it. That's the way her mother did it. And that's the way her mother's mother did it. And so it's ingrained in me. And we know that that's not true. And so what we're looking for is a complete transformation. And what we know from God's word and now from science. Look at that. Science has to catch up to the Bible. And, and my, um, my humanist psychology professors and scientists, they get so upset with me when I say this. How dare you put the Bible? It's not evidence-based. Oh, my goodness. God created us, created the world. He doesn't have to be what, what beholden. More proof do you need? to scientific evidence. I'm not saying we don't need it. We need it, because it's the world we live in. So, you know, we have to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, right? But give to God what is God's, and we need to be transformed. So here's what we also know. Oops. Okay. A crisis in marriage and family is a spiritual crisis. You see the people getting divorced. You see the people not doing well in their marriage, if you observe them, if you're to become a, um, a qualitative scientist and you're doing participant observation, that's what they call it, and you're following these people around, it's ethnography, and you're making notes about their lives and stuff. If you watch people who are falling apart in their families, follow their spiritual practices or lack thereof. We're back to the wise and the foolish. Um, check anyone whose marriage is falling apart, and you'll find someone who doesn't spend much time with God. Oh, but Pastor, I, I know all 13 memory verses. I can recite them. That's head knowledge. Have you internalized the message of the verses? I know the 2,300-day prophecy. I can rattle it off. I can tell you all about it. But... Do I know where I fit in that salvation history? A crisis in marriage and family is a spiritual crisis. Every time Elaine and I have had crisis in our marriage is because I'm not praying as much as I need to. I'm not depending on God as much as I need to. Every single time. Personal experience. And we're so different. You heard uh, Dr. Susan saying how compatible we were? Oh, that's because we work hard at it every single day through the grace and power of God. But we are so unalike. <laughs> I like it cold. She likes it hot. Well, not too hot. <laughs> not anymore. When we got married, we had to buy an electric blanket for the winter because she likes it hot. She can turn up her half of the blanket and I could turn down my half of the blanket. <laughs> Have you heard of people that don't get along, one zigs and the other one zags? That's us, that's us. But with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love of Christ constrained us. I like to be on time. Not that Elaine doesn't like to be on time. But it's not as high a value for her as it is for me. I'm African. <laughs> I, I so this morning, <laughs> we were rushing to get here. And oh my goodness, I had to pray three times. <laughs> because she was in the kitchen. We're staying with the bakers. And we usually don't have regular breakfast. We have a protein shake. And we travel with a little um, blender. blender. And... Um, 
Actually, it's my blender, uh, even though she bought it for me. And, 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 and she got to my blender before I got to it. And I thought she was moving so slowly. And I wanted to tell her, can you hurry? But I didn't. That was the Spirit of God. <laughs> Without the Spirit of God, I would have blown a fuse and said, are you crazy? Why are you taking so long? You did well, sweetheart. You did really well. Because I knew that he was exercising extreme restraint. And someone I says, no, no, But it. someone says, ah, but I have to be me. Yes, and do what? Destroy your marriage? Destroy your marriage? So let me tell you a quick story as we come to an end, because we, we need to end. So I run walk in the mornings, two, three miles every morning, just to try to stay healthy and to be around for my children when they have children, if and they do. And my wife, remember? And my wife, of course, my wife. <laughs> but you know, if I'm staying around for my children, I'm staying around for my wife because, you know, my wife is close. I, I We've been married for 33 years, 34 I want years. My, I want my own staying around. Okay. Okay. It's going to be 34 years this year. So I went run walking. Well, let me tell you. I, she says I have to tell it fast. So here it goes. So I went run walking, and I left her in bed. Remember, she doesn't want to get up at 5. So I got up, went run walking. And by the time I came back, she was in the sunroom, her favorite room, the one where Dr. Ruguri's basket is. And, and uh, Elizabeth's now. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> Elizabeth made him. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so she is in there, and I go back up to our bedrooms. I'm getting ready to take a shower, and I walk into the bedroom, and the bed, our bed, is unmade. Oh, I hate unmade beds. I hate walking into a space that has stuff all over the place, and when a bed is unmade and the sun is up and we are up and about, I want the bed to be made. Okay, let me just interject here, because I don't want you to think that I'm a slob. <laughs> I, too, like to have my bed made. I just don't think I need to make it as soon as I get out of it. Because I just may want to go back into it. So I want to give myself a little room to express my flexibility. So. 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 I'm on the second floor. She's on the main floor. And I step over by the steps. And stairwell, so she can hear me, because she is on the other side. I said, hey, babe. I'm disturbing her devotional time. I think she was done by that time. At least she tried to be done. She says, what's going on? I said, the bed is not made. She says, that's right, the bed isn't made. That's all she said. And, and then I went back, and I am and I was rebuked by my own conscience. Wait, no, you said something I, else. I, did I? And, and, and you, you so said So we usually it? don't remember what we do. You, 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 you we always remember what the other, one per, the other you, person did wrong. You, you didn't like my response. I could tell because there was a pause. But what did I, you say? I suspect, I said, okay. Oh, okay. Um, through gritted teeth, of course, because I was highly irritated. Um, even though... I was more irritated. The bed wasn't made. <laughs> The so, bed wasn't made, so and, st and no one was in it. So I, fi I figure whoever is the last person that comes out of the bed should make it. So, so, so he, that's exactly what he said. And, but he, he got calm. We have to practice what we preach. Yeah, yeah. And he said, can I ask you a favor? <laughs> and I'm downstairs, literally, look at my face. I'm like this. And he says, is it okay if, if you're the last one in the bed, if you can make it when you get up? You, you notice what's happening here. You notice, this is an interpretation because she's <laughs> over there. She's not even seeing me, but she just, that's an interpretation. And that's what we do in marriage. That's, that's what we do in marriage. We're always interpreting. <laughs> that's how I interpreted it. Now let me, let, me, let me share something with you. I was livid. I mean, just, t I, I can't even be, like anger was just riling up in me. And the, and the Lord had it that we were in two separate places, so I couldn't see his face and he couldn't see mine. But I had just gotten up off my knees. And that morning, I was so happy because no one was around. 
He went for a long walk. He must have walked five miles that day. And I had like a good hour of devotional time. And I was on my knees, and I was reading the Bible, and I was meditating on God's word, and I was saying, Lord, please transform me. This is no lie. This is my prayer every day. Every day. I'm, I'm not making this up, because we want to at least try to live what we preach. So I was saying, Lord, help me to not respond to Willie in a defensive way. This was my prayer. Help me to, to be kind and sweet, even though he's going to tell me some, it, something strange that I don't like. And here he is. So I'm off my knees now. And I'm, I'm euphoric because I've had this beautiful mountaintop experience. Right? But now I've come back to the valley. And I'm being told, this is what That's I heard. That's not made up. You slob. No, you no, slob. I didn't say he that. He didn't say that. But say do you that. see, this is what I'm hearing, Dr. KK. You know, what are you, out of bed? You didn't even make the bed. Like, what? You know, okay, that's what I'm hearing, and I'm mad. And all of a sudden, the Spirit says, didn't you just ask me for power? Your oil has long done run out. Where is your replenishment? Where is it? Are you using it? There, you don't have to gather up the, the oil and go out to the store. You just prayed for it, and I gave it to you. And so, that, that, so I just stayed in the kitchen, and I just calmed down. This is what it looks like in real time, folks. But I still couldn't bring myself to say, yes, dear. Because, you know, I, I had to allow the spirit to calm me down. But during that time, what happened? Well, what happened? I made up the bed, and um, <laughs> I, I made up the bed bec because I need, any of you familiar with Asian culture, I need feng shui. I, I need the place to be clean and to be clear. But you did something clear. else. Yes, I, I did something else. Actually, no, she did something else. Later on, a few hours later, she came to me, and she said, you know, what you said this morning, she said, and she said it very nicely. No made-up face, no bile. You know, she says, we've been married for over 30 years. She said, after 30 years plus, and all we know. I mean, if you need the bed made up, can't you just make it? <laughs> I was, my spirit was rebuked by her by being so, what's the word I'm looking for? Logical. I'm calm. Because it's true. So how, how do I push it back at you? And someone said it earlier today. I'm trying to remember who did. About being African and, and men. I think Dr. Boytumelo, was it you? I don't remember. Somebody said it. And said something like, that in Africa, men have oh to be yes men, and yes. they, they, they don't have, they don't want to say this, or they don't want to say the other, and that's not what the Bible says, that's not what it says, and if we're going to be light, we have to embrace the gospel, we can't embrace the darkness, the dark pieces from our culture that says, I'm the man, that's not a servant leader, that's not Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave. So my making up the bed is giving. Amen. Gave. If you go into marriage for what you can get, you will never have what you really need. You have to go into marriage thinking, what can I? Why? Because we're disciples of Jesus. And what does he say? What does scripture say? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. If we're going to love like Jesus, we have to give. Not get. The thing about it is, when we give, we get more. This is how it works. Mm, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Give us five minutes, we're done.
We get excited when we start talking about these things. What did I just say? You said you were going to give them something else. When yeah. You, when you get you, you the more you give, the more you have. The more you give, and you were going to give an the example. The more you get, yes. This is for my brothers. I love the men of the church. This is for my brothers who have lots of testosterone. <laughs> I heard it in the sermon this morning. <laughs> that if you don't give, and then it makes someone go looking. Well, well, here's how it works. There are two halves, you know, and we can help ourselves. The greatest need of women is affection. Around the world. Around the world. And Thank the greatest you. need of men around the world is sex. I'm only saying the word because Sister Boy Tumelo said it. <laughs> That's the only reason I'm saying it. She gave you permission. She did. So, give your wife affection. What is that? Nice words. Nice words. She needs to talk. Most of her affection comes from talking. So when you get home from work and she wants to talk, talk back. At least listen. Don't just turn on the TV and watch the football and, the news. you know, and, and, or the news. The same one that you watched five minutes ago or ten minutes ago. So, if you fill her love cup, because remember, it's not about what you can get. It's about what you can give. So you're going to give her a gift. What's that gift? Affection. What's that like? Speak to her. You know why your wife often reaches out to hold your hand? You know what men think when their wives reach out and hold their hand? They say, ah, she wants me. No, she doesn't want you. She wants to hold your hand. <laughs> the problem is, the problem is that every time she holds your hand, you go crazy like, oh, yeah, I'm getting lucky today. And she gets scared because every time she holds your hand, you act all crazy. <laughs> Calm down. But if you listen to her and you talk to her and you're nice. And don't, and don't try to solve the problem. Yes. Because it's not solvable. And you make the bed. <laughs> it may be something different for you. You're not the Olivers. You, you have a different issue. But whatever that issue is, think about what can I give? Not what can I get? Brothers and sisters, if every African man in this room, in the continent, in the church, would internalize the message of what can I give instead of what can I get, it will revolutionize every marriage on this continent. You will have less divorces, more happiness, more joy, more sex. <laughs> My brothers, you want more sex? You have to give more affection. You got to be wise. You got to be wise. Let's end, Elaine. So, I'm sorry. We've gone over. Let's all right, end. So Let's we want to have some solutions. Yes. So our families need replenishing oil. And what is the oil? We need the oil of grace. And you can, you, we will put this up on the, uh, the, the, the website. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So we need more grace in our homes. We need unconditional love, and the baker spoke about that last night, so I don't need to go into it. Um, we need empowerment. What is empowerment? Empowerment is love in action. We lift each other up. We build each other up. We don't tear each other down. If there is some way in our culture that is oppressing the other person, it is not light. We need the replenishing oil of empowerment in our relationships because we want our relationships to reflect God's character. And last but not least, we need forgiveness. And again, it's, it's always amazing to me when we speak at conferences how our topics gel and we don't even talk to each other. So they spoke about forgiveness and Dr. Susan mentioned it again today. So you know what it is and you know that it's necessary. In fact, one, one psychologist said that forgiveness is the necessary tourniquet that stops the bleeding when inevitable wounds come. In this world, we will have trouble. 
The fact that we're Christians doesn't mean we're not going to have problems. The fact that we have Christian marriage doesn't mean we're not going to have problems. But when we have this replenishing oil, we can solve our problems. Our homes will be different because we're ready, because we're prepared, because we're wise. So we started with this text. We're going to end with it. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. Let's read it together. For my thoughts are not your your thoughts, thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're going to have dynamic family relationships. We need to have the mind of Jesus. Because the carnal mind is an enmity with love is patient, love is kind. You can't do that. You can't be patient. You can't be kind. Enoch. Is that Enoch? It's good to see you. We met a year ago. I hear you. Maybe that's a strange thing to say in Africa. Because men don't have babies. Well, women don't have babies alone. There's no such thing as spontaneous generation. Let's get back. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And that's what we're calling you today. Why? Jesus is coming. And if you don't have the mind of Christ, you won't have reserve oil. And you won't be like the five wise virgins, you will be like the foolish virgins. And what a shame. We know the bridegroom is coming. We're part of the wedding party, but half made it in and half did not because they didn't really pay attention. Today we need you to pay attention because we love you. That's why we came. That's why we've planned. We came. And so we're closing. And as we're closing, we want to remind you, Jesus is coming soon. And we do what we do, not only to have stronger marriages in the Adventist church. We do what we do not only to have stronger parents in the Adventist church and stronger families. We do what we do because... The great day is coming. And the Elijah message is about turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the father. It's about being patient and kind. Because if we're not patient and kind, we won't be ready. And that's best operationalized in marriage, in the family, in the home. And then the Adventist church will preach. Because I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. In fact, there are lots of people on this continent who are not Adventists because they can't hear what you say because of what you do. So it's time to just be on the side of Christ. Who believes the word of God? Who believes the word of God? Who wants to do the word of God? Praise God, because here's the promise of success. It's hard, but here's the promise of success. Mm. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is the promise. It's a good promise, and he will keep it if you trust him. But to trust him means to believe what he says and to do what he says whether we're in Africa or in South America or in Southeast Asia or in Europe or anywhere in the world, it's the same. So we're going to pray for you. 
And we only want to pray for those who want to be ready when Jesus comes. Those are the people we're praying for. If that's you, let me see your hand. We're going to pray. Would you stand? Let's be Russian. Let's stand. Let's stand as we reconsecrate our lives to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the showers of blessings that we've experienced here these last two and a half days. Lord, we've been challenged. Our minds have been expanded. Our hearts are full. And we're leaving here recommitting ourselves to being more like you, to reflecting your image, to shining light in a dark world. And thank you, Father, that we can trust you because you're trustworthy. Because what you say is true, always. And so today, I pray for my brothers and sisters as we pray for ourselves, that we might be like the wise virgins. Not only invited and knowing about the coming, but ready with extra to share. Help us to be people in relationship who think about what we can give rather than what we can get because then you will give us ah, a crown of life. We pray that for everyone in this room and their families and their constituencies. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless God you. God bless you. We're going to have our last event at supper. We're a little late. But we wanted to say a lot to you today in little time. Thank you. I think we probably might have many of them before the end of the weekend. You can go there now. God bless you.